Hey everyone, welcome to Talk Early. In this lecture series, we will be discussing about engineering economics. This is the first video in this lecture series and in this video, I will be walking you through some major terminologies used in economics. The topics covered in this lecture are what is economy, types of economics, economic indicators, types of economic systems, what is market, what is competitive versus non-competitive markets, what is market price, extent of market, real versus normal price. So without wasting time, let's move on to the introduction. Economics is a social science concerned with the production, distribution and consumption of goods and services. Before going further, I would like to tell something. In this lecture, I will be introducing you to a lot of definitions. It's advisable for you to have a good grasp of these definitions as it will help you in solving numericals. Okay. So, economic studies how individuals, businesses, governments and nations make choices on allocating resources to satisfy their wants and needs, trying to determine how these groups should organize and coordinate efforts to achieve maximum output. So, these two sentences over here summarize economics in its basic form. Okay. The founding of modern economics is credited to Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, who published the book An Inquiry into the Nature and the Causes of Wealth of Nations in 1776. Having said this much, let's move on to the details. Economics is divided into two major branches. The first one is microeconomics. It deals with the behavior of individual economic units. These units include consumers, workers, investors, and owners of land or business firms, etc. It explains how and why these units make economic decisions. For example, it explains how consumers make purchasing decisions and how their choices are affected by the changes in price and income. It also explains how firms decide how many workers to hire and how workers decide where to work and how much work to do. Okay. Now, the second branch is macroeconomics. It deals with the aggregate economic quantities. It focuses on overall economy on both the national and international level. The topics studied include foreign trade, government fiscal and monetary policies, unemployment rates, the level of inflation and interest rates, the growth of total production output as reflected by changes in GDP. Okay. Now, one thing you should keep in mind is that these terms are relatable. For example, if we consider the whole world as an economy, if we take the case of a particular country, for example, India, then with respect to the whole world economy, the economy of India can be considered as a microeconomy. Okay. But on the other hand, if we consider the economy of a state of India, then in that case, the economy of India as a whole can be considered as macroeconomics. So you got the idea, right? It's all about relative. An economy may be considered as microeconomics or macroeconomics based on the level of extent we are covering in that particular case. Okay. Now, the next topic is economic indicators. Economic indicators are reports that detail a country's economic performance in a specific area. Some key indicators are GDP, retail sales, industrial production, employment data, consumer price index. These various key indicators are used to determine a country's development. For example, you must have seen reserve banks of countries issuing statements regarding how GDP fell or risen over a quarter or in a year, etc. The growth or deflation of these indicators has major influences in the economy of, of a country or the state we are considering into account. Okay. Now, another thing we need to study is the different types of economic systems. The first one is capitalism. Capitalism is a system of production whereby business owners, that is capitalists, produce goods for sales in order to make a profit and not for personal consumption. In capitalism, capitalists own the business including the tools used for production as well as the finished product. Workers are hired in return for the wages and the workers owns neither the tools he uses in production or the finished product when it's complete. Okay. The economy of USA is an example for capitalist economy. The next type is socialism. Socialism is a system of production whereby workers collectively own the business, the tools of production and the finished product and share the profits among themselves. Examples of socialism are cooperatives like Amul, Milma, etc. You can see that these firms like Amul and Milma are collectively owned by the workers and the profits are shared among themselves only. 
okay now the third type of system is communism communism is a system of production where the private property ceases to exist and the people of a society collectively owns the tools of production communism does not use a market system but instead relies on a central planner who organizes the production and distributes goods and services to the consumers based on need an example for this is the market system of cuba ussr etc now i want you to understand the difference between socialism and communism in a clear way most people use these terms interchangeably but this is not true in socialism the production is motivated by profits only that is the firm produces for maximizing the profits however in the process of communism the production is motivated by social welfare that is everyone gets the goods and services in an equal manner and no one has an advantage over others that is the reason why market system ceased to exist in communism okay now and the classification of economy is based on whether they are developed developing or underdeveloped the countries are classified into developed developing and underdeveloped based on their industrial base human development index and many other parameters okay an example for developed countries usa developing is india brazil etc and underdeveloped are most of the african countries like kenya nigeria etc now we'll move on to the definition of market so what is a market a market can be defined as a collection of buyers and sellers that interact with each other resulting in the possibility for exchange a market has mainly two components that is sellers and buyers buyers include consumers who purchase goods and services and firms which buy labor capital and raw materials that they use to produce goods and services on the other hand sellers include firms which sell their goods and services workers who sell their labor services and resource owners who rent land or sell minerals to firms okay now a market can be classified into competitive and non competitive markets a perfectly competitive market has many buyers and sellers so that no single buyer or seller can significantly impact on the price for example are agricultural markets for example if we take the case of rice thousands of farms produce rice which thousands of buyers purchase right so no single farmer or buyer can significantly affect the price of rice right that is the reason why it is called a competitive market however it is not a necessary condition that a competitive market should have a large number of firms in it some other economies with fewer number of firms in it can also be called competitive for example if we consider the case of telecom companies in india they price competitively among themselves to win customers right so it is also an example for a competitive market now on the other hand in an in non competitive markets the buyers or sellers have the power to influence the price either directly or indirectly usually non competitive markets exist when there are only few number of firms producing a particular product however there are certain markets which are non competitive even though there are many producers for example is the world oil market if you are the kind of person who reads news regularly then you must have heard about the opec cartel which is a group of middle eastern countries who jointly decide how much oil to produce in their countries thus the world market of oil is dominated by the opec cartel and the prices are influenced by their distance for example the last time when the oil price dipped under 50 dollars per barrel the opec cartel decided to reduce their production level so an artificial shortage is created in the world market which caused the price of oil to increase again to over 50 dollars per barrel so this is an example for a non competitive market where the firms can affect the price of products okay another term you should be familiar with is market price market price is the price for which a good or service is offered in the market in a perfectly competitive market a single price the market price will usually prevail for example if we consider the case of agricultural products like rice vegetables etc you can see that there is no significant price change between the products of different brands which sell the same product right however in markets that are not perfectly competitive different firms may charge different prices for the same product this can happen because one firm is trying to win customers from its competitors for example when jio came into the telecom market in india back in 2016 they provided all their services for free why in order to only win the customers from their competitors right another reason for this to happen is that is 
different firms to charge different prices for the same product is when customers have brand royalty. For example, Rolex watches are considered luxury watches even though the quality of watches produced by its competitors are also almost the same. Okay. Now, we will study about the extent of market. Extent of market refers to the boundaries of market both in terms of geography and in terms of range of products included in it. For example, a housing market can be considered as a local market. Let me explain this. For example, consider a city A and there are lot of workers in the city who are looking for a housing. Okay. Now, consider that there is another suburb B which is a suburb like 100 kilometers away from the city. Okay. And consider that in city to rent a house it costs around uh, 10,000 per month. Okay. And in the case of suburb, it's just 1,000 rupees per month. So, if you are walking in the city, where would you rent the house? In A or B? Most people will rent the house in A only, even though the price of rental is high. Why? Because if we consider the case of driving 100 kilometers every day, it is profitable to have a house in the city itself. So, we can say that the housing market of city is localized to the city itself. That is the reason why housing market is called a local market. However, if we consider the case of gold, it is a global market. Why? Because we can see that the price of gold right now is around 39,000 rupees per 10 gram. Okay. So, even if we transport the gold over large distances, the transportation cost is relatively small compared to the price of gold itself. That is the reason why gold market is a global market. Okay. Now, we will learn about real and nominal prices. Nominal price of a good is just its absolute price. On the other hand, relative price of a good is the price relative to an aggregate measure of price. So, we can say that the difference between what 100 rupees can buy in 2019 and what it could have bought back in 2000 can be understood by converting the 100 rupees from a nominal value to a real value. Okay. Real values are more abstract. Real values transforms a nominal value by considering the price level change over time. So, a real value is always relative to some other time period other than the present. That is, it can be relative to the past or to future. This is not true for nominal values. Suppose we walk into a store and we see a price tag of rupees 30 on a bread loaf. Okay. So this rupees 30 is the nominal value of bread in 2019. Now, suppose that back in 2010, a loaf of bread cost only rupees 10. Okay. However, we can't equate the rupees 10 in 2000 to rupees 30 in 2019. Okay. To account this, we need to convert the rupees 30 to a real value in 2000 prices. If price level has risen over time, then real value is always less than nominal value. This is because what a consumer can buy with the same money has declined over time. For example, with 120 rupees, now we can buy only 4 loaf of bread as the price of a loaf of bread is rupees 30 in 2019. However, back in 2000, we could have bought 12 loaves of bread using the same money. However, if we consider the inflation rate of Indian rupees from 2000 to 2019, we can say that the real value of bread only increased slightly. However, the nominal value has increased from rupees 10 to rupees 30. Okay. Another way to explain this is to consider the case of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a country facing hyperinflation. While I am making this video, a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe costs 4.5 Zimbabwe dollars. However, two days before, so this is the present case, okay? And two days before, it costed only 1.5 Zimbabwe dollars. That is, the same loaf of bread costed only 1.5 Zimbabwe dollars. And if we convert this Zimbabwe dollars to Indian rupees, two days before, 1.5 Zimbabwe dollars was just 
one Indian rupees. However, presently one Indian rupee is equal to 4.5 Zimbabwe dollars. So, if we consider the case of bread two days before and now, the nominal value of bread has risen from 1.5 Zimbabwe dollars to 4.5 Zimbabwe dollars. However, if we consider the value of bread in case of Indian rupee, the price remains the same. So, we can say that in this case, the real value of bread, that is 1 Indian rupee, has stayed constant over the two days. However, the nominal value has risen by $3. Okay. We will be discussing more into the details of real and nominal prices in the following lectures. Now, to sum up this lecture, microeconomics is concerned with the decisions made by small economic units. The second point is, a market refers to a collection of buyers and sellers who interact and may result in exchange of goods and services. The third point to note is, a market price is established by the interaction of buyers and sellers. The fourth point is, when discussing a market, we must be clear about its extent in terms of both its geographic boundaries and of range of products to be included in it. The fourth point is, to eliminate the effects of inflation, we measure real prices rather than nominal prices. Real prices use an aggregate price index such as consumer price index that is CPI to correct for inflation. That's all for today's lecture and if you understood this lecture, please like this video and also subscribe the channel. Also, please do take part in the poll at the end of this lecture so that I can decide whether I should continue with this economic lectures or take up some new topic. Okay. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.